Hello, everyone, and welcome to our digital stage. My name is Anthony Green. And my name is Ashley Gordon. And we are the co-founders of Castle of Our Skins. Thank you so much for joining us in our third installment of our Founders Chat series, where we will be talking to Black women who are doing the work. Today, we have the multifaceted coloratura soprano, scholar, pedagogue, and entrepreneur, Dr. Louise Toppin. Dr. Toppin has garnered international acclaim for her operatic orchestral oratorio and art song roles in the US, various places in Europe, South America, Asia, and the Caribbean, performing in places like Merkin Hall, the Kennedy Center, and Carnegie Hall, among many others. Since 2010, she's been on the summer faculties of the Baltimore Summer Opera Workshop, the vocal course for the National Conservatory in Bogota, Colombia, the Amalfi Coast Music Festival in Italy, and the Accra Symphony Operatic Course in Ghana. She's a much sought after clinician throughout the United States. And as a scholar, she's lectured on the music of African-American composers and has appeared on NPR's All Things Considered. She served on several boards, such as the African American Heritage Commission, and she's the director of the nonprofit organization, The Damus, as well as an administrator for the George Shirley Vocal Competition on African American Art Music. After a prestigious career as the Kappa Kappa Gamma Distinguished University Professor of Music and the Chair of the Department of Music at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, she joined the voice faculty at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance in Ann Arbor, adding to the legacy of incredible Black musicians and scholars who have taught there in the past. Thank you so, so much, Louise, for your work and all that you do. And it's such an honor that you squeezed in some time for us for this Founders Chat. And I would just like to start off by asking you to introduce yourself, maybe perhaps talk about where you're from and where you're currently living, your musical and your creative journey, and anything else you'd like to share. Thank you so much to both uh, Anthony and Ash. As I've said to them privately beforehand, I'm so proud of the incredible work that this team is doing and all that Castle of Our Skins is doing as well. I think it's fantastic. Um, I am originally from Akron, Ohio, born there, but moved to Virginia. Ettrick, Virginia is my hometown. Um, my father taught at Virginia State University. He was a history professor of uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. He also taught at Virginia Commonwealth University and started their grad program in that area. And my mother was an English and reading professor at Virginia State, so I'm an academic kid. Um, my musical journey is a little more circuitous. I started off as a pre-med uh, person at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. I, I played the piano from the time I was a, a little child. My parents said I would crawl up on the piano bench at about age four and I'd start playing whatever had been, whatever symphonies or sonatas were on the radio, I could actually imitate them at the piano. And my sister was studying with Undine Moore. And so I was taken to her lessons as a child and my parents would, um, you know, began to ask her if I shouldn't be studying piano because they said the little one is, my sister's older by five years, they said the little one is practicing the piano of what the big one is supposed to be doing. And uh, Dr. Moore, who was a family friend and like an aunt to me would say, no, just let her keep coming and observing the lesson. So I saw the music being stuck in the fire place that she had, she had little places all over her living room. I can still see it where the music as she would compose it would sit in the room. Um, but that, so I, I was thinking of music as a hobby. I loved playing the piano, but again, because I, I didn't start actual lessons till age 11, which is a little later than a lot of times with kids. And during that time, um, I was studying science and math and really into it. I wanted to be a cardiac, a cardiac surgeon. And so I went to grad, undergrad, uh, UNC Chapel Hill is actually my undergrad. I went there to study medicine, uh, but also I was taking piano. There was a wonderful piano teacher, my high school teacher had recommended. So I was taking piano. I was interested in theory, I'd never experienced theory in those courses. So I took them just to see what they were. 
Um, found out I had perfect pitch while I was there. Uh, I took a theory test, uh, sight singing dictation, excuse me, took a dictation and the professor said, oh, you have perfect pitch. Well, I didn't know what perfect pitch was. So I said no, thinking that I didn't want to, I was too embarrassed to say, I don't know what perfect pitch is. I don't know what you're talking about. So he said, you cheated on the exam then because you got 100. And I said, let's back up. Let's go, what, what, what exactly is that perfect pitch thing? So he tested me and he said, you have perfect pitch and you didn't even know it, um, which as a singer has come in handy. As a pianist, you know, it didn't matter to me that I had it, but I ended up graduating with a degree in piano because they wouldn't allow me to double major and keep that medical part. So I had to make a decision at uh, some at that juncture. And so I did finish with a bachelor's in piano, went to Peabody to work as a uh, pianist. I did my master's in, P in piano and I was doing a lot with accompanying in both um, programs. And someone heard me sing at the age of 25. So while I was at Peabody, I got admitted to their program. And then I, that teacher put me in touch with George Shirley. He was at University of Maryland I began studying with him for one year there and he said, you should do a doctorate. So I applied to Maryland thinking he's crazy. Nobody's gonna, I was the equivalent of a freshman. I'd had one year of voice. Who's gonna admit me on a doctoral level? Um, but I did do it. I, I listened to him and my father said, never apply to just one school. So well, he is the one that suggested Michigan and Indiana. And I got into all three schools. The biggest fellowships, full fellowships came from both Michigan and Maryland. So I remember calling George Shirley in that April and saying, I'm going to, you know, turn down Maryland because, I mean, Michigan, because I just got into Maryland and they gave me the bigger fellowship the same weekend he was hired by Michigan. And had I not applied to Michigan, I wouldn't have been at Michigan. And then Michigan also figured out with the paperwork, I should have gotten the same size fellowship that I was being offered at Maryland. So I actually ended up at um, Michigan. And so that's sort of my musical journey. I did have one other uh, strange thing. Well, there, it's never circuitous. I mean, it's never um, an accident. But as a child, Willis Patterson taught at Virginia State. He and my parents were good friends. And so when I did go to audition at Michigan, I looked just like my mother. And when I walked out, he said, you look like Antoinette Toppin. And I said, that is my name, because my first name is Antoinette. I said, that is my name. And he said, do you remember me? I was at Virginia State, I was four years old. And he said, I was at Virginia State and something about the voice kept ringing in my ear. I know this voice and I remembered. He had done a mall and the night visitors at Virginia State. My dad took me backstage to meet him and he scared me to death because he was in costume. And he said, hello, little girl with that deep voice. And I just remember scurrying behind my father's leg and kind of looking out to see Willis Patterson. So how unusual is that, that I get back to Michigan as a student and now I'm back as a faculty member about to celebrate Willis Patterson's 90th birthday this fall. I'm hosting a, a celebration to honor him as a pioneer. That's, that's an, an amazing um, story and so many connective points with so many illustrious um, trailblazers in and of themselves. Uh, really, really amazing. I'm wondering um, if, if Boston was part of your sort of many cities and many um, connections and specifically with, with the um, sort of connection that I first, I think, um, had with you was with Vidamus, which has roots here in Boston. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about Vidamus, which you now run, um, and how you joined the, the family, and what, what is it? Absolutely. So Vidamus is a nonprofit company that is, organization that is, uh, promotes the music of Africa. The, the mission was the music of African American women and underrepresented composers. Um, and so my, it was founded in 1986 and it was a performing ensemble based in Boston, but particularly in the New England area, founded by Vivian Taylor, uh, who is still a dear friend to this day. Um, and I was hired to sing on a recording, um, more still. It was a piece, a, a recording about William Grant still. And she, she had a, a, an arrangement of his Caribbean suite. 
Um, I remember I sang that with Robert Honeysucker and, and Ruth Hamilton. And then we did um, different art songs and spirituals by William Grant Still for Cambria label. They had done about four recordings before I did that one with her. They had been the first to do a William Grant Still recording um, of, of ensemble repertoire, because I remember there was harp with it from the Boston Symphony. Oh, her name is, is, is I know it's what you're Pilot. Yes, yes, yes. And Pilot. Thank you. I was like, it's escaping me. But that's a kind of repertoire. It wasn't a song um, CD. It was one that was um, chamber music. They had done George Walker um, and they had done, uh, they had done African American women. I remember that one. And I think this was about the fourth or fifth of their recordings. So Bill Brown, who became my singing partner for 15 years, was good friends with Vivian Taylor and suggested me for the soprano when they were, they had Pamela Dillard for the mezzo on a lot of their things. They had Bill Brown as a tenor, they had Bob Honeysucker, or they had Ruth Hamilton as a mezzo, but they didn't really have a soprano in their core, if you want to put it that way. So she hired me for that recording, and I did a second recording with them called Good News that wasn't finished until much later. Um, but around that time, Vivian decided she was ready to give up Vidamus, and she didn't want to see it just dissolve because Vidamus had become that pioneer that was putting out recordings of African-American music before anybody else. Um, and so it had that space already, and particularly, as I said, doing New England concerts, which you guys have now taken over. I love it, that space. Uh, but that's where they were. And so in 1997, she asked me if I wanted to take over Vidamus because she had seen that I had business acumen and um, an interest in that this was my dissertation research area was African-American music. And she wanted to know, would I move into that space? So I had to think about it because I had never thought of running an organization or a business, really, because it's a 501c3. But with the help of my sister, who's an accountant, um, and my first chairman of the board was T.J. Anderson, who had been her first chairman of the board. I moved the organization to North Carolina, where I, I was. It, we're still incorporated in Massachusetts, but the physical running of the organization was in North Carolina. And with that first board, we talked about the three parts of the mission for women African Americans and underrepresented. And I and the board decided that it was too much to focus on all three areas. So very quickly, we let the underrepresented piece go um, and decided that there still were not many people working in the space of African American concert repertoire. And so we decided to really focus and build that piece of it. Um, and along the way, we did do some with women. I would say our main focus has been on African-American music. And over the years, um, which is what, 20 some years, 22, 23 years now that I've done this, um, we did, we added the George Shirley competition, which is now a nationwide competition with $30,000 given annually to students from high school to our newest division, which is pre-professional. Um, and so I love seeing the students coming from across the country. We've even had international students. And we use it not only as a way and a platform to teach African-American art songs, spirituals, and opera arias, and music of the diaspora. So we, we have them registered to do all of it, but we teach as a part of it. There were six master classes and classes as a part of the competition last year. Well, we couldn't do it this year, but in 2018, when we did the competition, 2019, when we did the competition, we want to make sure it's a space where people don't just come for their 10 minutes to sing and get nothing else. Instead, I said, and this is where I'm a teacher, the teacher in me said, we have to do master classes that particularly focus on spirituals or how do you sing art song or what do you learn about them? What are the resources? So that's what we're doing in a weekend now. And then we have a composer's competition on top of it so that they're interacting with young African-American composers. So that's been our most recent push, but we've also done children's programming in the state of North Carolina, all middle schools in 
Eastern North Carolina, we got a grant and we were teaching them African American music. We've been doing recordings. We're up to about 30, I think now. Um, we have the premier recording of Leslie Adams songs and uh, Robert Owens and Richard Thompson. So we've tried to move into the contemporary space, but also we also have that recording of All Hall Johnson, which is to pay homage and the first William Grant Still opera. So we're very intentional with the recordings that we've done now. I love that more people are doing recordings and digital spaces and all sorts of things. So we will probably be doing even less and less. At one point we were doing quite a bit, but my whole point was to show people something is possible and then step out of the way and move into something different. So my something different has been the competition, the database that I've created for African-American um, composers that's online, some of the publishing that I'm doing. We're moving in different ways away from what we were doing, which was recordings, live concerts, student residencies. Um, and we actually had a fund initially for college students that, that we now turned into the George Shirley competition. That was a long answer, sorry. Oh no, that's fine. It's all incredible stuff that the Damus and you are doing. And it's wonderful to see this legacy in action as an organic being growing and spreading its tendrils into all different aspects of this sometimes conservative classical music world. And I'll use conservative in place uh, of some other words that I can think of. Um, with that, <laughs> I you've already talked a little bit about the Damis's transition from Boston to North Carolina and the addition of staff and all of these different projects. And I would love for you to perhaps talk about any amazing interactive moments that you've had with audiences or students or with other members of your staff during the growth of the Damis and perhaps some growing pains or challenges that you face and how all of this has informed your career outside of the Damis. Oh, that's a large question. It's a good one. It, it, it's a good one. Um, so I should explain our staff is still a skeleton scat staff. Um, but one of the things I realized pretty quickly was that if I partner with others and work in collaboration, my staff became their staff. So, you know, we, we would work together on that. For instance, when I wanted to do the first William Grant Still Opera, we partnered with Vocal Essence in um, Minnesota. And so a lot of the work that we needed, some of the clerical administrative work was also being split between us them, St. Olaf, we were partnering with several, and then the singers that we hired to do the project. Um, I do have a core team of people, especially with the competition, that has to have quite a, a robust staff. But I also try to use um, graduate students who are from the University of Michigan and maybe have even taken my class. I teach a, a course in African-American art song and so it's one of the few in the country that undergrad, grad, doctoral music student, uh, voice majors actually take. Um, and so I'm glad to, you know, be a part of teaching them about it. So they're always excited and very willing to let me hire them because they now recognize the repertoire. They want to hear more. So that becomes part of our staff. But then I do hire a professional staff um, uh, of, of some publicity people, some graphic design, all sorts of, of people. So I would say among the growing pains has always been um, that I did a, a we've, got, we've worked with um, consultants on how to grow Vidamus and which I thought was very smart of us. We got some grants to through the state of North Carolina to figure out what the model should be for Vidamus any organization that's going from a one person organization to having multiple tendrils has to figure this out. And the model that one, after I'd worked with several of them, the model that one came up with, I liked a lot. And what she said is, you're all, it's like a flower. You are the nucleus of that flower. You're always going to be that nucleus because as the artistic and the director, you drive that artistic vision. 
and each of the petals, like the competition, I now have a young woman, um, sisters, Leslie and Natasha Gilliam, they really do the, the heavy lifting of planning. I do the fundraising to get the money, but they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting now because I've trained them what to do. And they're helping us to get better and better and bigger and bigger. So that when we started with, you know, paper applications, now everything's all online, digital space, you know, they're helping us move it. You've got now things on the internet that we're, we're really moving into that space. And so among the, the growing pains, I think always as a, an executive is learning how to listen, to listen to those around you, bringing on a smart team around you. And I do surround myself with young people. I, I love my generation, but I also want to hear from the next generation that is thinking differently. And I want to learn differently from them and be able to deliver to the next generation. So I need their help. Why am I going to tell the next generation how to do things when I'm of, you know, a different generation, but we can work together. So I've learned a lot from them, but I'm also training them in terms of what we've been doing. So I would say that that's informed me a lot in terms of as an executive of Vidamus. The other piece though is, Although my career always was singing and, and lecturing on African-American music and teaching it, that is informing a lot of what I do. I've started doing more conferences in the last couple of years to bring people together of multi-generations to talk about this repertoire, but more importantly, to be a space, because we don't really have one, where you can find out what people are doing. There's a lot of people, we're now in a, in a generation that there are so many people doing African-American music in some form, writing it, composing it, you know, singing it, whatever, and they don't know each other because we're all isolated in our own, um, I almost equate it to a Zoom box. It's like they each have their own little box and they don't know who, who's in the box right next door to them. And so that last conference that I did um, at Michigan last year, that was the focus of it. It was to celebrate not only the number of years that Vidamus has been that collector of people and of ideas, but it was more this time to say, you're doing this, guess what? This one on the other end of the country is also doing that. Maybe you two should talk to each other and see if you can, instead of working at cross purposes, can you work together? I'm doing the same thing. I have a database and another person approached me. He's doing an all song database. Mine is particularly on African-American composers. And I said, he said, can we work together? I said, absolutely. Why wouldn't I want to work with you on that? I mean, I've talked to Ash about what she has done with string players. We're all trying to figure out how to centralize this and make it so that people can find, find us. I don't think I answered all parts of your question, but I think that some of it. <laughs> That's a perfect answer. Beautiful, beautiful answer. Um, there's obviously so much passion and so much heart and um, listening, as you say, in, in connective elements throughout all of your career. Um, and probably I could answer this for you, but I would love to hear your, your answer in the sense of sort of, sort of why, I mean, a, a lot of it seems that it's, it's, about education, about about teaching, about sharing and connection. So I guess the question is with being at UNC Chapel Hill and in Michigan and the various things that you've already talked about, how education has played into your sort of passion and into your career and why it's so important to, to be in, in a space with, with youth and sharing as, as you are. Um, why, why education for you? That is actually a really good question because, um, you know, when I came out of school, I was thinking like everybody else, I'm going to go off, have my upper career and, and, and have my life and enjoy it. Um, and it's not that I didn't do that, but I think part of starting later, because I didn't start until I was 25, I didn't grow up with the dream of doing that. But what I did grow up with was two college educators. And my father was internationally known as a historian. Um, my father headed the ASALH, and part of when he was the president in the 70s, 
they led the legislation to change Black History Week into Black History Month. So I would hear those discussions because they were happening at our house. I would hear, um, I watched my father give these lectures and what I loved because he would, he would just take us, watching my father talk about Civil War and Reconstruction was so informative um, because he was so passionate about his subject um, and because he was so knowledgeable, he one of his favorite uh, lectures was talking about myths of history. And he would say, I'm going to talk about 10 myths of history about African Americans. And among them included things such as, you know, that Africa is a backward continent. And I would watch people, you know, an underdeveloped continent. I would watch people's mouths drop and you could see the true fascination because his audiences were mixed audiences, sometimes colleges, sometimes professional, you know, uh, civic organizations, churches, it could be anywhere. But watching how people lit up and listening to the kinds of questions they asked, they were genuinely interested in her hearing about African-American music. I mean, African-American, I'm so used to music, African-American history which they had never heard. And that same comment, which I get with my class, is why have I never heard this before? How have I gone through my education and not heard that? So, you know, in my head, for at least the first 18 years of my life, and actually even further, my father was brought to, uh, I taught at East Carolina for my first full-time job. I remember one of uh, my later years at East Carolina, my father was hired by the history department, which was the next building to music, to come to, to lecture at ECU. And I remember that lecture because they also did an article about Dr. and Dr. Toppin, um, since we were both Dr. Toppin by that point. But just, you know, I had watched this man now for 40 years lecture, and it still, he was in his 70s getting the same response and the same enthusiasm um, from audiences. And that's what drove my passion. It, um, I, there's also an urgency with me that I didn't want this music to be lost. And that's what helps to drive me is that people like Margaret Bonds, I know we'll probably talk about this later, but that's what has driven me for actually close to 30 years to work on Margaret Bonds to the point of getting the score finally published for the first time. You know, this is music from the 1950s that should have been published, but never made it. Um, and so that's what drives me, that people need to know the, the depth of African-American music, the narratives that are out there. Um, and so I want to give that to the next generation. So that's why I'm enthusiastic. And with two lecturer parents, I didn't have a prayer. As much as I wanted to be, you know, pure opera singer, I was going to be a teacher. And I'm happy I made that choice. It was tiring at times. I remember flying to London to do a performance and getting back and having to teach from 8 p.m. to midnight on a Sunday. And I just arrived from London that afternoon because I'm trying to make up lessons. But I still had the energy and enthusiasm because I wanted to give my students the best that I could present to them. And many of them have actually gone into the field of African-American music, those that are African-Americans and those not. That's what's been beautiful. This is incredible. I had no clue that your father was involved in historical mythologism. I've been thinking a lot about mythologism and neo-mythologism, especially in classical music mm -hmm. and how that translates for the most part into this romanticization of white European composers. But when you talk about Black composers, we don't have the luxury of being mythologized. So there's always this under, under background layer of caution and hesitance. And that's why you get people saying, oh, well, we can't program this music because what about quality and all of this? <laughs> right, right. It's unfortunate. I mean, that because they don't know, people still use terms like that that are quite painful to hear well, I'm sure there's nobody of quality, but you know, un implicit bias is about the fact that you don't widen your circle beyond your own education, your own um, center. 
And that's part of why it's so important to me that I'm in the academy trying to, to present a different narrative and say, no, African-American music is for all of us. It is American music. And, and my, my real hope, I know it's never going to happen in my lifetime, is that we get so good at incorporating African-American music in the teaching of Western European music that it doesn't have to have the African-American part, but it's all American music. And I actually said to someone on another interview not too long ago, I said, why don't we ever teach Western European music from African-American composers? You could do the exact thing that we all do and maybe go home with a homework assignment that's Mozart, but maybe you've taught St. George for that day. Exactly. Flip the script. You know, it's, it's exactly. Yeah. A, a friend of mine, just a quick uh, interjection here, last night um, had a concert with his middle school, high school chamber music camp, uh, Dr. Adam Cordell, if you're listening. Uh, and he did first and second species counterpoint with spiritual melodies. And beautiful, great. Everyone had to do a little research on their spiritual. Everyone had to learn about counterpoint and they were beautiful. Yeah. Uh, if we introduce it to, to young people, they don't have a bias against it in terms of it's not good music. That's why I went after that grant of all middle school string students in Pitt and Wake County when I was in North Carolina. And I went to the teachers. They thought I was crazy. I'm a singer. Why is a singer saying, I want all your string players and we're going to do a thing with a string quartet. It was actually a string quartet from Boston that came down the Colbert Taylor string quartet came down and they worked with quartets of middle school students. They were all performing William Grant still. And so they were teaching them the history of this music and they had them perform it. What an experience for those kids. And then we did a concert in the city so that they could see how, and I sang with them so that they could hear this music. Those kids were, you know, they were like telling their teachers, that was the best thing we've done. Yeah, that was so neat. But you know, we do it once. We get to do something once. Yeah, that's I, yeah, unfortunate. Yeah, it is unfortunate. I'll be happy when we have multiple recordings of everything I've done. I hope somebody re-records it. Yes, I really do. I hope we get to that point where there should be five or six recordings of Robert Owens instead of the one. Oh, I mean, 500, perhaps, because there are 500 recordings of Fur Elise and Anne Chloe and all of those pieces. I know that's going to take us more than a few minutes to get to that point. I'll take the five. Get me to the <laughs> five. <laughs> and I, I, will, I will be at, at, at peace if I can get to five. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. We've been talking so much about Vidanus and education, but we have not been talking about you as a singer oh. and you have sung everywhere. You know that we we all love to travel. Um, I went to visit Ash in London when she was playing with the, the Pops and Ash has played in China and Germany and Switzerland. And of course I live in the Netherlands. I performed in Turkey and Cyprus and everything. And you have also performed everywhere, Ghana, Italy, Asia. Ah! So I would love for you to just talk about, oh, I love that background, by the way. <laughs> this is my Italy background. This is where I'm supposed to be working right now on the Amalfi Coast in Italy. So that's what I do to my students in, in this month. I said, when you see this, it means I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. So I would love to for you to talk about some of your favorite performing experiences and what have been some of the most beautiful encounters you've had and experiences you've had while traveling. Um, gosh, there's been so many. Um, one experience, I remember the first time I sang for, it was about 10,000 people. And I remember walking out on stage and I'm trying to even remember where I was, but I remember walking on stage and just that feeling that it was such a sea of people and that they were going to hear what I was going to do. And I remember, um, I do remember singing in Japan. Um, I sang Messiah and I remember the line to talk to me was wrapped around. I sang the soprano solo 
um, and the line was just wrapped around outside. I took an hour to greet everybody, and the manager kept saying, do you want to cut it off? And I said, if people are standing in line, I'm going to stand in line and talk to them. I may be tired, but I remember from when I, at, I saw Leontine Price several times as she was doing her farewell. Exactly. She was doing her farewells. And that was the thing that impressed me is she stayed there. And Jesse Norman too. Jesse Norman was, um, when she came to Michigan, I was the last person in line and she asked me if I wanted to buy Girl Scout cookies, which first of all, I went, what? And you know, a poor student, I said, please let me have whatever $2 I needed to be able to. So I bought the cookies and I had a friend with me, Jethro, the bassoonist. So I bought the cookies and then she said, she said, tell me about yourself. What are you doing? And I said, I'm studying voice. And her manager came then and said, Miss Norman, you've been backstage for a long time. You, it's time to go. And she said, no, I'm talking to Louise Toppin and she's going to be an opera singer one day. That just, you know, because again, I had only studied voice at that point four years or three years. And so I'm thinking this, she's seeing and hearing something I can't see, uh, you know, but it's people like that that taught me. And George Shirley, he's one of the most gracious people on the planet. They taught me how to be. And I remember one concert, this husband and wife came up. I remember I sang Guide My Feet and they were crying as they came up to me. And they said, thank you so much for that spiritual, because what you just sang with that spiritual has helped to give us energy um, to go forward because the wife evidently had an illness, a terminal illness. Um, and then my last, I mean, all over the world, I've had wonderful responses, people who don't know what spiritual is about. I remember singing in New Zealand and I sang a spiritual and the Maori sang their music back to me. We had a wonderful dialogue, yes. And it had the same type of passion that you hear in spirituals. And so that was a, an amazing exchange. And what I've tried to do as I've traveled the globe is I try to connect to people and learn what are you about? Who, what's your tradition? What's your music about? Uh, and the last one I'll stop with is um, my recording, He'll Bring It to Pass, um, the Spirituals of Hall Johnson, ended up in a jazz radio station in Chicago. And I thought, okay, well, I didn't know this until the person contacted the manager, I mean, it contacted the president of Albany Records to say, this man took the recording home one Friday evening because um, he didn't get the chance to listen. He said, oh, I'll just put it in my car. So in his car is his mother, who had been a friend of Leontine Price, an opera singer, his wife, and his son. His mother had Alzheimer's and had not spoken or sung for 10 years. And so he put the recording on, and because I was singing these old Hall Johnson, he said she started singing at the beginning of the recording. And he said he had to pull over in Chicago traffic because he said, they all just cried. She sang for the entire CD. And he, and so my, the president of Albany said, if you don't do anything else, I don't care if anybody buys the projects. The thing is, it's going to touch the one person it's supposed to. And that's how I feel about it. I can get bad reviews about them. I can get whatever, or nobody picks it up. But hopefully whoever that one person that needed to hear it is going to hear it. That's, that's so beautiful. And I don't even think I can ask my next question about if there is one thing that meant so much to you and your scholarship and your work, what would that be? It sounds like everything. Um, it is everything, but it, it really, you know, the Margaret Bonds that I've been doing, that has been so special to me because I've gone through so much. Um, I knew Margaret Bonds' daughter, Dionne Richardson. Um, I met her because I had to get permission to record um, the songs that I found. I found 11, 9, 11 songs by Margaret Bounds in a basement of Charlotte Holloman in DC when I went to coach with her. Nobody, she couldn't get anybody to sing these songs. And she, and Margaret Bonds, I found out later, Margaret Bonds had written one of the songs for Charlotte Holloman. And there's the manuscript in the basement. And so I said, well, I'll look at them because Charlotte Holloman was a color tour too. So I looked at them. They fit me like a glove. I loved them. So on the CD I did of, of African, I mean, of American women, 
I put those nine songs. Well, from that moment in 2000 on, people started bombarding me with where's the music, where's the score, where's the score. And so I was like, well, I'm sure there's a publisher somewhere that'll do this. It wasn't happening. And so I finally decided, oh, maybe 10 years ago, okay, I'm going to see what it takes to publish. I've never published anything, so I didn't even know the steps. But my father, as an author, I had seen him getting permissions, da, 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 you know, so I somewhat knew some of the steps. So I started the journey. First, I had to get the permission of the family. Well, by the time I started it, Dion Richardson had passed. Um, she, she actually died quite young, and her estate was intestate. So the state of New York swept in and took the estate. So, and she was the last of her line. So I had to figure out, um, and very securitously, but again, the right person comes into your life at the right time. Somebody heard me on NPR talking about Margaret Bonds, who knew Dion, gave me a name, and set me to the right person, who really is the legal heir of Margaret Bonds. But that wasn't the end of it. So I got to a publisher finally. I had to find publishers. Got to a publisher. E.B. Marks was bought out by Hal Leonard. My contact, who had been the president of E.B. Marks, no longer was able to do the project. And we were at the point of publishing the songs about five years ago. So all of this has been taking, you know, steps and journeys. I've gone through probably five or six publishers to really work with them and see if I could entice them. I sent prospectus to all these people um, until I finally got to Glenn Dower Jones of Classical Vocal Reprints who said, absolutely. And I realized that's the place it should have been because he's shown a commitment to African-American composers all along. So, you know, I am a believer that, that God or higher being, whatever you want to call it, will tell you that, yeah, you can try to do all those things, but this was where you should have been anyway. And so, you know, that's why I'm so proud of this beautiful publication now that is the product of, you know, 30 year journey almost. Um, and when it's done, I guess I'll have nothing else to do, right? <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> I don't think you'll ever stop. <laughs> no, but we're, I've got that and we're the Hail Stork. We're getting ready to start the first Hail Stork publication this month. I just saw the design yesterday and it's really beautiful. And so we're ready to, I have four anthologies this summer and one recording. We're just about to launch. And the, the Margaret Bonds and Hailstock, that's also on African Music Diaspora Project on your, on your website, on your database? It will be on, yes, it will be listed there. Um, I think she actually listed the, the Bonds is on the Vidamus website. The, we're going to also have to put it on the diaspora. I actually have three websites that are, four websites they have to manage because they have the diaspora, they have the Vidamus, they have the George Shirley competition. And then there really is, I do have a career as a singer. So there really is a louisetoppin.com site that is the most neglected of, we keep everything else up to date. And then uh, it's lucky I get, you know, my manager, thank goodness she gets me gigs or I wouldn't be singing because I have forget to update my website. <laughs> Professional problems. I love it. <laughs> can't do everything. And, and to me, no. honestly, I am the least important in the equation, in my opinion. And so I, I am here on this planet to do this, to, to get this music out. It's not about Louise Toppin. Yeah. I think, I think many people would probably disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> But you have been so eloquently talking about these recent projects. I recently just bought the Margaret Bonds digital spiritual suite. I'm so excited to get at the piano and, and learn those first two movements. I've been playing Troubled Water for quite some time now. So I'm so excited about learning the first two movements. Well, and so, it, changes, it changes the piece when you have the first two, then you, the explosion of Troubled Water makes sense from the two more contemplative movements that lead you to that. Exactly. It's now going to have a greater context for me and not betray the original vision of Margaret Bonds, right? Right. Because it just <laughs> come out of no, I played it too when I was young and it's like, it just comes out of, it's a great piece, stands alone, just beautifully. Yep. 
but it just felt to me like something was missing. And until I started researching and realized there were two movements and then found those. So. It's amazing. I love archives it. Archives are important. We all need to be in archives finding this stuff. Definitely, definitely. So with that, can you talk more about the other projects that you have coming up and how can everybody find these projects? Absolutely. Um, am I a co-host that I can do a screen share by chance? Let's see. I think Ash is going to set that up for you and that will happen very, very soon. And I have this cover. I can yes. show you um the oh okay let me do something. that would be great for everybody to be able to see this information directly and we will also link um share any links that you have on our social media so this was the will be the first of the hail Stork series um but on, i'm calling it all of the damas african-american art song series i didn't even know i had a series now i have a series um but as you can see we're We've got lots of information about this is a set of songs that's uh, for voice and clarinet in French. He wrote these two songs in French, which um, and then here's the, the back of the the uh, anthology. But we have that one. And oops, am I still screen sharing? No. Okay. You just, yeah. <laughs> and here's the other one. So that's just about ready to go but we finally got that cover done here's the songs and that's what people have really been waiting for that this is the listing of the number of songs by margaret bonds the majority have never been printed that's quite a long list isn't it that's and, a big list and what was even this one gone up it what i had a funny story about that is that um the publisher i happen to have been doing a concert in Arkansas, uh, Ray Linda Brown and I were having dinner with him, and I happened, yeah, my friend, and I happened to mention that I was doing this publication um, or working on it and trying to collect them. And he said, Oh, Margaret Bonds, huh? So he goes to his basement. Basements must be where these songs are all over the country. I'm just, I just, I want to do a basement scouring to see who has this music. He walks up with a manuscript of Guan Up. I'd never seen a reference to it. I've been searching and reading all these references. Nothing. So among the songs in the anthology are pieces like that that I'd never even found a reference to. So, yeah, so that's the... That's so that's amazing. Always, always so many amazing stories. I wish yeah. we, could, we could chat all day. Um, but I think to, to sort of wrap up our time, um, maybe a big question but one how how people can stay involved with what you're doing you, you gave us the four websites and we'll definitely post those um and also just since that you have been so in, in ingrained in this field what what are other other ways for people to to also get involved in this sort of scholarship and changing of narratives and um, advocacy well i think that um, thank you for that. I hope that people will get in, in, in involved and, and feel free to get in touch with me through either my Michigan um, email, ltoppin at umich.edu. Um, and people do. They talk to me about their dissertations. They're interested. They have ideas. So I try to help point people in the direction. But I would start doing some skirt surveys to see what's, out, what's not happening, what is missing in terms of our story. There's a lot that's missing. I did the first William Grant Still Opera. There are eight more that haven't been done. So that would be one of my dreams is how do we get the other eight so that they are not, a couple of them haven't even been premiered. So we need to do old work as I also want to see us uh, document what's going on now. So we have, a, we have a lot. There's tons. And I am keeping my eye sort of on the field to see who's doing what and you know i'm trying to i'm trying to be that voice and that person who is watching um all that's going on but i would say you know contact me look at do start doing some archival research you come up with names and you go i've never seen this name before that means go down that rabbit hole and start figuring out who is that and why that why haven't we heard of this person i'd love to see more work done on 
early, early people, as in the diaspora people, because we sort of don't know these roots very well. We know Garcia, we know um, Coleridge Taylor, and there are some, you know, people. But I'd love to see us fill in more of that story of who in the early part of our country was a black composer writing and what were they writing? And I know that, of course, after slavery, you're not going to get a whole lot pre-slavery, but in the diaspora, you might get a lot more uh, things. There's some interesting things happening in Africa now in terms of art songs, for instance, but I'd love to see more research coming out of that area where what is come the whole diaspora i think needs a lot of work a whole lot of work and i think some of the historic people i think bonds and price sort of coming to life but everybody around them is still a name but not a not a story yet i'd love to see people start to do some video diaries of living composers before you lose this generation i actually had a dream years ago that it would have been nice to start to document um, using video the stories of these composers. And I was thinking like an Ollie Wilson who just passed. T.J. Anderson is 92 this year. Is anybody doing that work to make sure that these stories are preserved? Because these are our founders who really push the narrative for all of us in the academy and all of us as African-American composers and performers. Um, but, you know, there's lots that can be done that. Who's doing the academic writing? Where are the books? I've been pushing my friend Tammy Canerdo toward Margaret Bonds <laughs> or Undine Moore and some of those people. There are lots of stories and lots of people, particularly the women composers. They're lagging even farther behind where are their where are their recordings, their writings, their um, scholarship? So there's there's so much that can be done. It sort of depends on what someone is interested in. It's I'd say there's more do not done than there is done. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you, and I'm so glad that you're saying this because so many people sometimes have this question. Well, what should what can we do and what is there that needs to be done? And it's finally refreshing to hear somebody say, there's actually way too much that needs to be done. There's more that should be done that, than has been done. So right. thank then, you so much. Well, and the last piece of that is archives, that yeah. the composers are giving their stuff. Unfortunately, there's not, that's another thing, a compiled list of who gave to what archive. I know that Undine Moore, Dawson, they're at Emory. You, I, I just talked to Alvin Singleton. He is, is in Columbia. I mean, so that means they're scattered across the country. So in order to do that research, you have to know where they are yeah. to go do it. Yeah. But there's so many possibilities. And yeah. I just want to inspire people to, 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 tell, to value the fact that if without our story, you're only getting a part of history. And you need the African-American perspective to have a full appreciation of the American story. Amen. And with that, I think we will close out this amazing interview. Thank you so, so much for your wisdom, for being so honest and open. And everybody watching, please go to the websites that we will link and share with you purchase these scores and tell all of your friends to purchase them and do the work just as uh, Louise is doing. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, everybody. Thank and you. Thank you. Appreciate it.